I'm Jim Weinstein. I'm a law professor at uh, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today um, in alphabetical order, uh, which there's no relationship to the spatial order here, is uh, Ash Bhagwat, professor of law at the University of California, Davis, where he teaches administrative law, constitutional law, and economic regulation. Prior to teaching, uh, Ash worked for Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit and for Justice Anthony Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court. Ash is the author of the 2010 book, The Myth of Rights, and numerous articles on a, a wide variety of subjects which are piled up on my desk and I'm still trying to get through them. Um, his recent scholarship has focused on the relationship between uh, various rights protected by the First Amendment and the role of the First Amendment in promoting uh, a democratic self-governance. Uh, at your, uh, right now, to your far left, before uh, uh, Meg got there, is David Boddy, a partner with ba Ballard Spar, uh, where he chairs the firm's media uh, and entertainment group. David also serves as adjunct faculty at uh, ASU Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. He chairs the American Bar Association's Forum on Communications Law, and he has represented an array of America's top news organizations and, uh, and has argued uh, numerous cases all around the country helping to establish important precedents in First Amendment intellectual property and open government laws. And uh, 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 to my le immediate left is uh, Amy uh, uh, Gaida, is that pronounced that correct? Uh, whose research interests relate to media, freedom of expression, privacy, and the First Amendment. Among her many publications is her recent book, The First Amendment Bubble, How Privacy and the Paparazzi Threatened um, uh, a Free Press. It charts the growing assertiveness of courts in scrutinizing uh, media's uh, uh, news judgment. She is a formal journalist, a formal litigator, and a current professor at law at Tulane. And Amy is the past chair of the Association of American Law Schools Defamation and Privacy Section, as well as its Mass Communication Section. And then, now to my far left, and I'm not speaking politically, just spatially, um, is uh, uh, Meg Aletta Jones an assistant professor at Georgetown University's Communication, Culture, and Technology Department, where she researches and teaches in the area of technology, law, and policy. Her research interests cover a wide range of technology policy issues, including comparative privacy law, engineering design, and ethics, legal history of technology, robotics law, and policy, and, fittingly enough, the governance of emerging technologies. Uh, she has held a, a numerous uh, research fellowships, including at Harvard's Berkman Center, with most of you out there, and her current project, now I will, will uh, show my ignorance of technology, is Control Plus Z, is that how you say it? Or Control Z. Control Z, but that's with, uh, yeah, you know, you hold, I think even I know that, that erases everything, does it? It's the opposite of Control A, or Control Z, the right to be forgotten, it analyzes social, legal, and technical issues surrounding uh, digital uh, oblivion. Now. Each of these speakers, since we have four who have a lot of, to say, um, and also you have a lot to ask and to say, we're going to do it in 12 minutes per speaker, and we have a timer. We will, right there, can you see your yellow cards? And shall we just go from, uh, the, unless there's any particular order, we just, we just got into the room at the last moment. Shall we do it that way? Jim uh, to come out to Arizona. I'm going to be talking about the right to be forgotten, which I have spent a few years on. And one of the things that I love about it is that it is jam-packed full of issues, which is great to spend a lot of time on, but really not great for a 10-minute presentation. So what I'm going to do is introduce the right with a little comparative exercise and talk about some of the challenges associated with developing a right to be forgotten, and then talk a little bit about the 
framing and technical issues associated with the right. So the right to be forgotten is about legally addressing digital information that lingers about in individuals and threatens to shackle them to their past through opaque data processing and online judgment. So there's this sort of front end, back end part of the right to be forgotten. The back end side asks whether you have a right to go to Facebook and say, Facebook, what data do you have about me? Delete it. Uh, the front end side is about what is publicly available about you online. So it is, those, those are questions about what the public can readily access about you through the internet. I'm gonna spend my, my 10 minutes on the front end side of things because the, the challenges there are a little bit more dramatic and so they're more fun. Um, one of the challenges that we have with the right to be forgotten is that it is tasked with accounting for an absurd number of informational circumstances. It's the internet, so it's everything. Um, that is from the most mundane, innocuous things that go online to some really, really tragic stories. So the, the images that you're gonna see on your left are European cases, and the ones on the right are US cases. Um, this is the very now famous Mario Gonzalez. Uh, he went bankrupt in the 90s, and there was a post of the sale related to his insolvency that went into the newspaper in 1998. And 10 years later, it was coming up on his Google search results. And so he went to the newspaper and asked that it be taken down, and they refused. He went to Google, asked that they remove it from his search results, they refused. And so he went to the Spanish Data Protection Agency, which is the AEPD, uh, and they took up his claim. They also went to the newspaper and then decided that the newspaper had a legitimate reason for maintaining the information, but Google didn't have a legitimate reason for processing the data. Google challenged that determination along with about 100 other ones through the Spanish court system, um, and the, the Spanish court system referred the question to the European Union's highest court, which is the Court of Justice of the European Union. A year ago, the Court of Justice handed down this decision that really shook the internet and what uh, search results mean uh, in a really significant way. And I'm sure that all of you have heard about the right to be forgotten because of that case and it got such widespread news. And so I'll talk a little bit about the ramifications of that. But what you need to know about it um, in basic terms is that the judge decided it based on the 95, two articles in the 95 directive. So the European Data Protection Directive from 1995 is being replaced uh, over the next few years with the, with the Data Protection Regulation, which includes an explicit right to be forgotten. But the judge decided um, these takedown cases based on the right of individuals to rectify or erase information that doesn't comply with the directive. And old, irrelevant, information information that is in excess of why it was collected in the first place all violate, those don't comply with the directive. And so it's a funny roundabout way that, um, you know, 20 years after the directive was passed and we've been having this conversation, uh, this right to be forgotten was sort of found in the old directive. So meanwhile, uh, in California, this is a picture of Chris Pertz. Uh, he was a football player at Cal Berkeley and got into some trouble at a strip club in 2006, and got, which got covered by the Daily Cal and resulted in him getting kicked off the team. And his life took this really bad downward spiral and he actually died in 2010. So his parents were incredibly distraught about all of this. And as they were going through the obituaries that were presented, there were references back to this 2006 incident. And so they begged the Daily Cal to remove the old strip club fiasco. Um, and the, the editor refused. And so they actually brought a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress against this uh, Daily Cal. Um, it was dismissed for two reasons. The first was that it was too old. So the statute of limitations had run on the original article. And the second was that it is really hard to bring a claim in the United States to uh, make the news take something down. So the internet is also full of these characters 
that we like love and hate. Sometimes we hear these stories and we just don't feel bad for the people that are involved. And other times we really do wish that there was something that could be done to help these people online. And um, over here we have Wolfgang Lawler and uh, Manfred Wuerl. Uh, they were convicted in 1993 of murdering uh, this famous actor and uh, over their claims of innocence. And when they were released in 2007 and 2008, they went to a number of websites and demanded that they be removed from the page that was referencing them in relation to their criminal past. This is a very odd thing for Americans, but it has a really long history in a handful of European countries. So the right to be forgotten is actually a, an analog right that's closely associated with criminal rehabilitation. So a number of these websites just complied because they felt like that was the right thing to do. And a few others complied because there were a few lower court cases in Germany that treated online archives as current disseminations of the same information, and so they could be held liable um, for continuing to provide access to that. Went up to um, the highest court in Germany and they, they uh, created this two-part test. It's, really, it's a really interesting sort of HCI exercise. Um, and it has to do with whether the information is pushed onto the user and whether it looks old. So certain websites could maintain um, access to these old criminal records and others couldn't. Um, this is not a picture of Lorraine Martin. I could not find her mugshot, but she, like Jim Morrison, was arrested in Connecticut. Um, she was arrested because her sons were running like a drug operation in her home. Uh, I don't really know her actual involvement in any of this. Uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that she had nothing to do with it. She was arrested um, in 2010 and was never charged with anything. So according to the Connecticut erasure statute, this was no, it was, all of the records were completely destroyed and she never had to claim being arrested. So she sued the newspapers that were continuing to provide uh, reports of her 2010 arrest for libel, saying that those were now a lie because she had been given, given this legal truth uh, through the Connecticut erasure statute. The Second Circuit did not agree with her um, and <laughs> they said that, no, no, the, the 2010 News reports are no less true uh, just because you were given this, uh, this sort of legal fiction. So, hmm. I am not attempting to play a file, so I'm gonna take that away. So, <laughs> these really, really big differences, of course, are rooted in these very different legal cultures. We have different institutional structures, uh, we have different prioritizations of values, um, but the result is that we have really, really easy forgetting happening uh, on one side of the Atlantic and virtually no forgetting allowed on the other side. And a huge uh, piece of this within the U.S. is a long-held legal doctrine that uh, for informational claims, you will not receive injunctive relief. You are entitled to monetary relief. Uh, so if I say something really horrible about Kate Darling on the Internet, she can sue me for money, but she can't make me take it down. And so we have this really long... <laughs> we have this really long um, entrenched doctrine um, that we're going to have to figure out what to do with. And some lower courts have started to offer injunctive relief in defamation cases uh, because they perceive the information landscape to be different, uh, significantly different than it has in the past. So another part of this problem, uh, another part of the problem with the right to be forgotten is that it feels so new. We never had to deal with an actual permanent record. So even though we have two different responses to the problem, they're surprisingly framed in the exact same way, which is digital, digital permanence. What are we going to do about digital permanence? So this is a PSA. I don't know if it'll play. Uh, I might just have to act it out. Okay, so I can do that. Uh, on the Disney Channel, there's a public service announcement <laughs> from Phineas and Ferb. And they sketch onto the moon the internet rules of the road. And it's, they're much funnier than me. But the gist is one of the rules of the road is what you put online lasts forever. And you never know what's, who's going to see it. So this is something that we tell kids over and over again through the Disney Channel. It's built into our education systems. And this is Amanda Top who killed herself uh, at age 15. Uh, she was a victim of cyberbullying, and she posted this video 30 days before she died, and it is such a, a haunting video. There's no sound to it. 
she just holds these cards up that tell her story. And this is one that really caught my eye. It says, I can never get that photo back. So she felt really, really trapped by this. So there are severe consequences to the way that we frame these technical problems if we don't uh, also add some legal or social remedy to them. What's really interesting about the way that this is framed is that it is not true at all that digital information is permanent. Uh, digital information is actually quite fleeting. 50% um, of US court citations, URLs in US court citation, Supreme Court citations are dead links. Um, the information, the research on digital ephemerality is pretty, it's a little all over the place and it's a small body of work, but it looks like 100 days is about the average uh, still the average length of time a web page lasts. Um, digital information suffers from all kinds of decay, from bit rot all the way to link rot. So a whole lot of things have to go right for you to get information. Um, and the last thing is sort of a side note, but I wanted to put it up here. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are curious about how Americans feel about the right to be forgotten. Uh, this, one, this was a poll done by Software Advice. And there are a large portion of Americans that want a European style right to be forgotten. One of the problems with this uh, study, though, was that this 21% here is um, that it's too hard to define relevancy. And so um, we, we lose some people because the study uses this funky term. So I am very excited to hear these other talks that I think are going to be a little bit more about the back end side of things. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, Meg. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to speak with you briefly um, about big data and government and how, in the name of privacy and sometimes expense, we're losing the ability to monitor the activities of our government. I hope not to preempt one of the sessions later this afternoon, but perhaps just to whet your appetite. Not long ago, we called it the information superhighway. Back then, the language of the internet was at least tethered to Earth. Today, it feels more like a scene from the Jetsons with Everyone sending reams of records into space, storing files in clouds, and landing loads of documents on platforms that can later only be accessed by password-protected users. It is believed that in the third century BC, the sum of all human knowledge could be housed in the library of Alexandria. Today, the world produces enough information to give every living person 320 times as much of that information as historians think was housed in Alexandria's entire collection. According to the authors of The Rise of Big Data, an article that appeared in a recent issue of Foreign Affairs magazine, and I quote, if all this information were placed on CDs and they were stacked up the CDs would form five separate piles that would all reach to the moon. That's an ex estimated 1,200 exabytes worth. And I'm sure some of you here actually know what an exabyte is, but it's a lot of information, a lot of data. This explosion of big data is relatively recent. 15 years ago, in 2000, only one quarter of all the world's information was stored digitally. Everything else was preserved on paper, film, or analog media. But digital data expands so rapidly, doubling about every three years, that today, and I quote, less than 2% of all stored information is non-digital. According to Kenneth Kukier, data editor of The Economist, and Victor Meyer Schoenberger, professor of internet governance and regulation at the Oxford Internet Institute, who authored the piece in Foreign Affairs. Now let's look at government information in the digital age. 
According to the Nonpartisan Public Interest Declassification Board, a single intelligence agency produces a petabyte of classified data every 18 months, or the equivalent of 20 million four-drawer file cabinets. As noted by Matthew Connolly and Richard Immerman, professors of history at Columbia and Temple Universities, respectively, we learned from their recent op-ed piece in the New York Times of a stunning National Archives estimate. And I quote, without new technology to accelerate the process, that information, all this classified data, would take two million employees a year to review for declassification. Instead, there are just 41 archivists working in College Park, Maryland to review records from across the entire federal government, one page at a time. Take the National Security Agency alone. By the close of the 20th century, the agency was collecting two million bits of data each hour. By 2006, as pointed out by Frederick A. O. Schwartz, Jr. in his new book, Democracy in the Dark, the NSA's collection had grown exponentially. The daily electronic equivalent of a dozen stacks of books, each stretching the roughly 93 million miles from the Earth to the sun. Here's one more example, the State Department which indulged Secretary Clinton's use of a personal email account and refusal to preserve emails on the department servers. And I quote, the State Department's Office of the Historian estimates that the department produces two billion emails a year. That's according to Professors Connolly and Emmerman. Plainly, the 55,000 emails produced by Secretary Clinton from her personal account hardly made a dent in the massive volume of information swirling through the government network. The biggest, newest challenges facing open government advocates today stem from a surfeit of information. As these basic facts, I think, show, the public sector produce, produces an astonishing amount of email and other electronically data, electronic data daily much of it classified. But the government isn't investing in its preservation or public access to that information as it should be. Sadly, the federal government devotes considerably more resources to protect state secrets than to preserve the historical record. Again, Professors Connolly and Emmerman, and I quote, the Information Security Oversight Office, the government's tiny watchdog agency, notes that of the estimated $11.6 billion spent in 2013 to keep information secure, only $99 million was spent on declassification, less than a third as much as 15 years ago. In the late 1990s, more than 200 million pages of documents were being declassified each year. Today, that figure has stagnated at around 30 million versus 200 million, despite a huge increase in classified data. In 2004, as you may recall, the 911 Commission warned, and I quote, current security requirements nurture overclassification and excessive compartmentalization of information among agencies. Each agency's incentive structure opposes sharing with risks, criminal, civil, internal administrative sanctions, but few rewards for sharing information. In the ensuing decade, however, things haven't changed except to get worse. In its 2013 annual report to the president, the National Archives and Records Administration disclosed that officials had made 95 million decisions to classify information in 2012. That's a 950% jump since the new century began, this according to, uh, to Fred Schwartz. We all know how hard it is and how long it takes to get information from the federal government. 
Congress discovered that reality last year when it tried to secure copies of even very recent emails from the Internal Revenue Service. But the obstacles to access created by big data aren't the province of federal agencies alone. All too often, media clients have asked for data collected by state and local governments only to hear the excuse that the cost of producing the records would be prohibitive, or that the agencies are not required to create new records for the public when we ask for data electronically or on disks. In the past year, the importance of access to police body camera recordings has revealed itself with shocking force. Local governments produce and collect more information than ever before. And along the way, we hear not only legitimate concerns about the protection of personal privacy, but also canards about the prohibitive costs of copying and redaction that block these records from public view. These are not insignificant issues. It would be misleading to understand big data only in terms of size. Big data is changing our way of thinking and how we see the world. Today, we can quantify many aspects of the world by rendering them into data as never before. Kukier and Mayor Schoenberg call it datafication. And it's making us think about the world less in terms of causation than it is correlation. And with only correlative information, bits of data that create a profile, decisions are being made on everything from the issuance of search warrants to the launching of drone strikes. I submit the public has a right to inspect this information. Question may be when, but how do we get our hands on it when there's so much and so much being classified? When it comes to accessing big data, the public needs to get on board and government needs to expedite the boarding process lest we lose the ability to follow not only the conduct of public officials, but the thinking that led them there. To maintain an informed electorate, open government advocates always need to lobby for access to records and against unwarranted secrecy. But we need to be doing more than that now. In the era of big data, we need to start building bridges with like-minded preservationists in government to lobby for funding that will give them the manpower and technology they need to comply promptly with FOIA requests and state public records requests. And along the way, we also need to start changing minds, especially of FOIA officers and records custodians who too seldom view government information as public property or recognize the rewards of prompt disclosure. With the rise of big data, there's no time to lose. I'm going to speak about basically in very displayed doctrinal terms whether and to what extent the First Amendment imposes limits under current law on the government's ability to regulate the storage, collection, and disclosure of data by private companies. And the short answer to give them my conclusion away is, is that the First Amendment imposes, I think, currently very serious restrictions on the ability to regulate in the name of privacy, and that we should all be very concerned about this. So when I talk about data practices and privacy, I'm talking about situations where individuals share data with private companies which then retain that data, process it, store it, and eventually potentially disclose it to third parties, usually for a fee. Um, and I, you know, immediately, of course, we go to companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and the problem of big data, which makes sense because they, of course, have the most information about us. But I want to emphasize, this is not a new problem, and it's more ubiquitous than we sometimes think. The problem of private companies sharing data goes back to telephone companies that have had calling records of ours for decades and decades, banks that have held our financial information for decades and decades, hospitals and doctor's offices that have held information for us. Um, today, it doesn't just include the big companies. Safeway knows what I eat. Um, and because of the, I use a Safeway club card, perhaps, unfortunately. Um, and the leading Supreme Court case on the subject, Sorrell versus IMS Health, involved a situation where pharmacies were collecting information about what kind of drugs doctors prescribed and then selling that information to pharmaceutical companies that wanted to use the information to, to market drugs to doctors. So there is a ubiquity here. Um, the difference, of course, is, is that the sheer scope of data retention practices and collection practices today have exploded because of the massive drop in the cost of computing and storage, which makes it possible 
for even a safe way, for example, to know pretty much everything I eat. Um, more, so the question is, what concerns is this race? And I want to posit something, which is, is that any time there is data retention, there are, of course, some privacy concerns, right? I find it creepy that Safeway knows what I eat. I find it a little more creepy that Amazon knows what I like to read. And what Google knows about me, I don't even want to talk about. Um, but as long as companies are internally using the data, not disclosing it to third parties, and most of the processing they do is automated, the privacy concerns are limited, and therefore I'm not going to focus my talk on that. The real concern arises when this party, this information is disclosed to third parties, because then the potential audience increases dramatically. So the question becomes, do those kinds of disclosures, mass dumps of private data, implicate the First Amendment? Or put differently, to quote Jane Bombauer at the University of Arizona, is data speech. She published an article with that title in the Stanford Law Review last year, and she said yes. And unfortunately, she's right. There's really no doubt that under modern doctrine, data is speech. So the Supreme Court has not really addressed this question fret on, but as I said, in the Sorrell case three years ago, it was posed with the problem of, five years ago, it was posed with the problem of a law which forbade the sale of the prescriber identifying information to pharmaceutical companies. The court did, did decided the case on very narrow terms, but it had this comment, quote, and this is Justice Kennedy speaking for six or seven members of the court. This court has held the creation and dissemination of information are speech within the meaning of the First Amendment. After all, our Facts, after all, are the beginning point for much of the speech that is most essential to advance human knowledge and to conduct human affairs. There is thus a strong argument that prescriber identifying information is speech for First Amendment purposes, period. So the implications are clear enough, and that has to be right. Data are facts, and facts are speech. When the New York Times publishes the names of soldiers who have died in a war, that's just facts, and yet no one seriously doubts that that speech is fully protected by the First Amendment. Furthermore, the New York Times is sold, not given away for free. So the sale of facts is also clearly protected speech. The further problem here is, is that privacy regulations typically take the form of content-based regulations of speech. And it's a little bit of a background for non-lawyers. The First Amendment, the Supreme Court's current First Amendment doctrine draws a very sharp distinction between laws that regulate speech based on the content of the speech in other words, what's being said, the message, or laws which regulate based on the content, or, or which are content neutral, which means they regulate the time, place, and manner of speech. Content-based laws are highly suspect. The test is called strict scrutiny and almost never upheld, while content neutral laws fairly regularly are. There's no doubt that typically privacy laws are content-based. That's because they specify specific kinds of facts, specific data, which is specific content, and single that out for regulation. A contrast would be, for example, a law that the court was faced with uh, about 10 years ago in which, which forbade the disclosure of any recordings that were a product of an illegal wiretap. That has to do with how the information was technologically obtained, not what it said. And the court correctly found that um, law to be content neutral, though it actually invalidated the law in the case. But data laws do not take that form. Most privacy laws take the form of specifying specific content that can't be disclosed. In the modern era, a majority of the Supreme Court has upheld a content-based restriction on speech precisely once, and that law involved association with foreign terrorist organizations. Now, this is not to say that no privacy law could survive strict scrutiny, maybe financial privacy laws, maybe healthcare privacy laws, but not most. My interest in keeping my shopping habits at Amazon secret is a reasonable one, but it hardly rises to the level of national security. It's not, it simply isn't. Go. So that strongly suggests that at least under current law, and I'll get back to that point in a sec, um, laws restricting the disclosure of data are unconstitutional most of the time. So maybe the solution then is to regulate the back end, to regulate the collection or retention of data rather than its disclosure on the theory that that's not regulated speech. The problem is there are both practical and, and constitutional barriers to that solution. Practically, first of all, it's hard to do. The reality is that the collection and retention of data is, fun, is incredibly useful. Much as I am bugged by Amazon's knowing everything about me, I find her suggestions useful. And for companies like Google and Facebook, their entire business model 
is based on collecting and analyzing data and using it to self-targeted advertising. If we take that right away, we lose things like free Gmail and free Facebook. And there's a constitutional barrier as well, which is that the collection of data, collection of facts, is an essential precondition to speech, indeed of most speech. That's what um, the court said in Sorrell. Now, the First Amendment's text does not explicitly protect preconditions to speech, but intuitively, one feels as if it has to. And in fact, recent cases, all in the lower courts, have confirmed that. The most important um, line of cases involves efforts by um, governments to ban the, recording of, the tape recording of police officers in public. Um, these laws have been struck down over and over and over again because, the courts have said, making speech is an essential precondition to speaking and therefore has to be protected by the First Amendment. And in this context, the right to make that speech trumps any privacy interests that police officers might have. And there are lots of other cases confirming a right to make speech, including laws involving making tattoos, making photographs, and so forth. The truth of the matter is, though, collecting, storing, and organizing data is no less the creation of speech than a recording or a tattoo if data disclosure is speech, which, as we have said, it is. And it is also true that laws that regulate the collection and retention of information also tend to be content-based. We don't say to companies, you can't collect any data about your customers because that would be ridiculous. We just say, I mean, the most we would think about saying is there are certain specific kinds of things, like, for example, what book titles you buy. Well, you could imagine that being sensitive, that you can't retain. But that, of course, is a content-based regulation of speech and therefore in trouble. So are we stuck? Maybe, maybe not. There's one way potentially out that was problematic. While well, big data and large databases are a new phenomenon, the clash between free speech and privacy is not. In a series of cases in the 1970s and 80s, the Supreme Court was faced with efforts to either punish or prevent journalists from disclosing private information. It was typically the names of rape victims or the names of juvenile defendants. The journalists won all of these cases, I should concede, but the court emphasized, that it never said that privacy is always trumped by free speech. Instead, it emphasized that those cases involve matters of public concern and therefore of high First Amendment value. Well, if that's the case, then maybe there's a solution here. Because after all, while Barack Obama's shopping habits or his healthcare records probably are matters of public concern, mine are not. And so one could imagine laws that target private information about private individuals, and they might survive. The problem is that this hope is in deep tension with more modern Supreme Court decisions. The privacy cases are old. They're all more than 30 years old. And the newer cases really have not tended to build on them. Instead, the court has really made two moves in recent years that are quite important. First, it has emphasized that the First Amendment does protect speech that is not political and not on a matter of private concern. Instead, the Roberts Court has said the First Amendment protects all speech except in very specific areas like obscenity or threats, which data clearly does not fall within. The second related, uh, closely related phenomenon is, is that the types of speech that the court has been um, protecting recently has been stuff really out there. The sale of violent video games to minors, intentionally lying about military medals, pornography on the internet and efforts to put it behind some sort of barrier, all have been struck down. I think I get two lessons from this. One, the court is deeply committed to its traditional doctrinal view that all speech was created equal except for some very narrow exceptions, and that government should not be drawing distinctions among different types of speech. And two, that technology is not going to change that. And frankly, Justice Kennedy's opinion in Sorrell suggests big data is not going to change the court's mind. So I think the court is wrong. I think that we should be willing to recognize a hierarchy in speech. I think we should be willing to admit that very, very private facts about private individuals are not as important as Das Kapital, and we should have a greater flexibility in, in um, regulating them. But unfortunately, I don't see any movement on the court's part in that direction right now. Um, people have said that we live in the age of the imperial First Amendment, and we see it in greater protection for pornography, greater protection for advertising, greater protection for campaign finance. And commentators have commented that in this era, lots of important social interests are being sacrificed. And what I fear is, is that privacy is the next way to go. Thank you.
Okay, so I'm going to be, I think, um, playing off that uh, notion uh, myself here pretty nicely. If I could figure out how to get the slideshow up here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Communications Decency Act, uh, and I'll get to um, what that means uh, in just a moment. First, a, a quick refresher on internet liability. Uh, and I say this because some of my students don't understand this when they, um, they start my classes. Um, first, the author of information on the internet will generally be held liable for their wrongful publications. And that means the person who writes it is going to be liable just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's particularly special. This includes journalists, website owners who publish their own or employee work and everyday people. It's the same as if they published it in the newspaper. That would include defamation, reputation, harming information that's published. It would include private information that's published. Uh, a tort called publication of private facts can help with that. Uh, it includes intentional infliction of emotional distress, emotionally harming information, uh, and other um, torts. But there are different internet players if you think about it. Uh, the people here on the left uh, are actually going to be commenting on a website. So they're people not affiliated with the website, they are commenters. To the right is the passive website uh, that exists just to accept those sorts of comments. Uh, what's interesting in the law, at least as it stands right now, uh, is that the people on the left, the commenters, will in fact be liable for the comments that they put on the internet, for defamation, for publication of private facts, etc. The passive website on the right will not be liable. And let me explain uh, what I mean uh, by using a story that's, uh, that's making news right now, and that is the adult friend finder hack. Uh, somebody hacked into this dating website, uh, found sexual information uh, about people, gathered names, email addresses, sexual information from profiles. Then the hacker uploaded that information uh, on the dark web and then tweeted some information, particularly about government workers uh, who had had um, uh, profiles on adultfriendfinder.com. This is a screen grab of that tweet, uh, revealing some uh, names and email addresses then uh, of government workers uh, who had profiles uh, on that website. So when you think about it, those who are potentially liable would include then the hacker for uh, invasion of privacy potentially, um, perhaps Cassie, the person who tweeted that information, tweeted private sexual information about people, but not Twitter or the dark web or any passive website very likely on which the hacker published the information. Now what's important here is that there's no connection between Cassie and the website. If Cassie had worked for the website, then in fact the website would likely be liable just as Cassie um, would be. Here's another example. This is from the Chicago Tribune from a few years ago. The Chicago Tribune did a story on clouding, uh, how politically well-connected and rich students were getting into the University of Illinois, despite the fact that their grade point averages and SAT scores were lower. Within the story, the Chicago Tribune made it a point not to name any of these, many of them underage, uh, students whose families had done this for them. Uh, but of course, in the comments after the stories, several readers named the students and revealed either privacy uh, invading or defamatory information about them, including the fact that one had failed, allegedly um, had failed uh, the bar um, exam. Those potentially liable there would be the commenters for revealing that information. Uh, if it's false for defamation, if it's true for publication of private facts, but not the Chicago Tribune, even though it hosted the comments on uh, where the host of the website on which the comments were published, and even though it did not take them down. The reason why those websites, the Chicago Tribune and Twitter, are not liable is because of something called the Communications Decency Act. And here's what it says. No provider or user of an interactive computer service, a website is how that's been interpreted, shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider, meaning a commenter. 
The reason why we have this Section 230 of the CDA is because Congress wanted to grow the internet in the days of AOL.com. AOL.com said, we can't be responsible for all the comments left on our message boards, uh, therefore um, pass this legislation. And Congress um, responded and said it was the policy of the United States to preserve the vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists for the internet, unfettered by federal or state regulation. What's particularly interesting, I think, is that print publications are, in fact, liable for letters to the editor. Uh, it's just that the internet here um, is special and there's a protection for, um, for websites. This is pretty good news for mainstream publications, I would say, pretty, pretty good news for all of us. CNN's not gonna be um, liable. The New York Times isn't gonna be responsible for um, commenter um, comments uh, that are left up. Even a website that exists solely to discuss crime news, for example, will not be liable under the Communications Decency Act for comments left um, by readers. The way it's bad is that privacy invading websites are also protected. Um, and these include websites like Campus or College Wall of Shame, uh, which is on the uh, upper right, uh, featuring embarrassing photographs of college students by name, usually. Um, dirtyphonebook.com, which is uh, at the middle, uh, where privacy invading information and defamatory information is published about people using their, uh, their real phone numbers. Uh, and then also dirty campus-like websites uh, on uh, the lower right here that are searchable by university um, where students reveal private information or defamatory information uh, about their fellow students. Even worse in my book is that the Communications Decency Act protects revenge porn websites like, don't go there right now because you will be horrified, myx.com, and these, uh, in my opinion, literally exist to harm. For those of you who don't know what revenge porn is, this is when a couple breaks up, one of the um, couple, um, one of the members then uh, posts nude photographs of their former boyfriend or girlfriend uh, as a way to get revenge uh, for the breakup. This is um, myx.com. Uh, today, when I looked at it um, just this morning, more than 10,000 um, people, uh, many of them women, um, had their images then uh, nude images posted um, on this website. The website literally urges get revenge and is searchable by city and by state. Myx.com is potentially not liable because of the Communications Decency Act. Why? because it is protected as an, a user of an interactive computer service, a website. Uh, it is prevented from liability uh, because uh, when it simply um, posts uh, what its readers um, have sent to it. Um, so here, myx.com is a passive website, uh, just like we might consider um, the New York Times. Uh, uh, at least that's the way um, courts have interpreted it. Again, what's interesting here is that print publications have in, felt, in fact been held liable for revenge porn. Hustler Magazine, for example, uh, that published um, inadvertently some uh, images of uh, nude pictures of women uh, was in fact held liable um, for, um, for that revenge porn. Uh, how do we know this? How do we know that um, myx.com would likely be protected? That's because of a website known as The Dirty. This is a website that started right here in Scottsdale. Uh, and, uh, and what the dirty is, this is a, a sample um, image from the dirty. Um, it solicits um, and then uh, publishes uh, humiliating, embarrassing images of others. Um, this is a young woman who apparently uh, drank too much at a party, uh, passed out, threw up, and uh, urinated on herself. Um, one of her colleagues then sent this embarrassing image uh, into the dirty, and the dirty um, published it. That's not the image that was the focus of Jones versus Dirty World. Uh, in that particular case, uh, the court described it, uh, the Dirty as a website that is a user-generated tabloid, primarily targeting non-public figures, usually to shame them. In this case, a poster in Jones versus Dirty World, a poster had suggested that a teacher had a sexually transmitted disease and had done inappropriate things at work. Um, the uh, website owner then communicated um, a little bit um, about the topic and suggested that the teacher should be wary of provoking the dirty army. The, under the CDA, the Federal Appeals Court ruled in favor of the dirty. And why? Because it said Congress enacted the CDA to preserve a free internet, and that enactment resolved this case. 
period. The CDA protected the dirty, even though the dirty is making money off of these images. Presumably then, the drunk student from a few slides ago, uh, the Vegas partier allegedly at the um, upper uh, left, um, the alleged um, inconsiderate roommate at the middle, and the bad boyfriend uh, on uh, the lower part of the screen, then would also lose any sort of uh, uh, lawsuit against the dirty because of the Communications Decency Act, leading the uh, owner of the website to call himself an American hero who saved the internet. But the problem is, of course, that there is unimaginable humiliation because websites like myx.com aren't liable because of uh, CDA protection. And these are just two images of the 10,000 um, women uh, and men uh, whose um, new pictures um, are featured uh, on myx.com um, uh, with a simple um, click of the mouse. Uh, by the way, they're named um, and, um, and also identified by, um, by address. Uh, what I think is interesting is that there are some cracks in CDA protection. One court did find the website The Dirty liable for defamation, um, and uh, the owner of the website decided not to um, appeal uh, that particular case. There are um, pending uh, cases against the dirty and presumably against revenge porn websites. Even the Jones decision suggests that, in fact, the CDA protection might not be as hardy as the dirty suggested it was, uh, and Jones had won a trial. I think that there's a way to balance internet freedom with protection for profound harm. My sense is that many in academia and many out there don't recognize that the Communications Decency Act exists and is the reason why revenge porn websites um, exist today. More people need to know, and maybe Congress would be responsive, uh, despite the fact that Google and other um, corporations like that are really pushing for the CDA. We do draw liability lines elsewhere in the law. I think it would be pretty easy uh, to take a look at websites that literally set out to harm others and draw a line there and give other um, websites uh, protection under the CDA uh, and not so those that exist uh, to, um, to harm. Uh, after all, I think that the Chicago Tribune didn't really know that anyone would be outing one of these students um, but in fact, myx.com recognizes uh, that um, when they urge readers to get revenge, that in fact, um, nude photographs will be uploaded. Thanks.